Hi, good morning. This is Matt Welch from Reason Magazine, the 40-year-old Bible for free minds and free markets. You can see back there. Uh, and welcome to Logging Heads TV this morning. I'm here with Megan McArdle, economics and politics blogger extraordinaire for The Atlantic. You can see her blog at meganmcardle.theatlantic.com. She's also worked for The Economist and various other publications. And just this morning, if I'm not mistaken, she was uh, name-checked by David Brooks in The New York Times as uh, a uh, new part of a new breed of uh, unpredictable and interesting right-leaning writers. Is that an accurate description of you, Megan? Yes, uh, fairly. <laughs> um, I actually found out about the, the Brooks name check over Twitter, which is somehow incredibly appropriate for web journalists. Yes. We are talking in Washington, D.C., both of us, but yes. uh, we have to do this by teleconference because it's about 1,000 degrees outside. Uh, and we're also uh, talking uh, just 24 hours after one of the more momentous uh, Supreme Court decisions in recent memory, uh, the 5-4 decision in uh, District of Columbia versus Heller, or vice versa, I can never get these things straight, uh, which asserted for the first time, arguably in uh, well a long time, that the Second Amendment is an individual right and not just a collective right for various weird militia members. Uh, you wrote something interesting yesterday on your blog uh, basically saying that, hey, I don't own a gun, I don't necessarily like guns, and this is awesome. Can you uh, describe for the layperson out there why someone who actually does live in D.C. Uh, and doesn't plan on owning a gun anytime soon, as far as we know, um, would find such a decision awesome? Well, I'm kind of tempted to own a gun, even though I don't particularly feel like I need one for self-defense. I just feel like now that I can, I should. Right. Um, it's sort of like if they legalize drugs, I might do a whole lot of them just to express my, my basic uh, agreement with the sentiment. Um, no, I, I think this is actually great news. I'm not a huge uh, proponent of the idea that guns make us hugely safer. I, I think – I don't know. I mean I'm not saying that they don't. I just think that there's not good data either way. Uh, I do think that what the data shows is that guns don't make us less safe, is that people who get registered guns – don't seem to then go off and commit crimes with them. You know, when we did concealed carry, uh, there's been a movement in a lot of states to go to what's called like a shall issue model of, of concealed carry, which is that if you meet certain basic requirements, like not being a felon, not being mentally ill and so forth, um, they have to issue you a license. There's no discretion on the part of the police, uh, as opposed to someplace like New York, where theoretically you could have a gun, but unless you actually work for the DA, DA's office, you would basically just never get the license. Um, and there was a, a prediction uh, that this was going to lead to, to altercations turning into, you know, sort of fatal gunfights. And it turns out that that didn't happen. There's been, ex like, vanishingly few crimes committed by people who got new concealed carry licenses. And it turns out that people who commit gun crimes, it's not just that they're ordinary people who in a moment of madness are enabled by their gun to act on it. Um, they're people who have a long history of violence in other contexts or depression if they kill themselves. And this kind of makes sense if you think about it, because we all have a lethal weapon that most of us operate every single day, which is a car. And if those kinds of lethal weapons actually did enable us to turn into raving madmen every time we got a little bit angry, I, I don't know about you, but there would be some dead people on the highway in front of me. Um, well, obviously, you haven't spent much time in southern Italy. Uh, I think this, these are used as weapons there, but, uh, you know, thankfully, we don't all live there. I've driven in Ireland, which, as far as I know, has the, <laughs> the highest rate of auto fatalities in Western Europe for good reason. Like, it's a company that just, it's a country that just recently got rich. And so everyone, everyone there, it's like their first or second car. They drive like completely insane people, and the roads are, you know, infrastructure made for the horse and buggy era. So I've never been as terrified as I was spending a week driving around Ireland. My poor ex boyfriend. I taught myself to drive a manual on a rental car. Well, I don't even know how they let me drive it off the lot, honestly. I stalled out about four times before I got out of the rental car office. Um, and, uh, and he just sat there getting, you know, he's, he's an Arab. He's just, by the end of the week, he just got, he was like white. <laughs> he just got paler and paler every day. Uh, and uh, not just I, from the lack of sight. I find, uh, I agree with you, in, or I'm similar to you in that I'm just in some ways not even interested too much in the utilitarian argument, does this make gun violence better or worse, or these kind of things. I assume I don't know the science, and, and, it's, uh, and I think as you had pointed out uh, previously, it is pretty weird that a lot of dodgy, uh, you know, academic uh, frauds or like a science have been, uh, has been conducted in the area of studying the effects of uh, guns on uh, crime. Um, but for me, like the, the most convincing utilitarian argument along those lines 
lines was actually in Bowling for Columbine, of all bizarre things, uh -huh. uh, the moments where when Michael Moore is just flummoxed by going to Canada and realizing that Canadians have just as many guns as we do and they're not killing each other and he just sort of shrugs his shoulders. That to me was, was uh, semi-convincing that it's not necessarily about guns. But your case is more about the government than it is about crime stats. Well, what, what is that case? Well, I think that, I mean, first of all, I actually do think that there is a, a sort of valid, I mean, I, I think that what the founders had in mind was the idea that people would be able to resist the government if the government became tyrannical. And that seems fairly far-fetched at this point, right? The government has howitzers, we have. Um, but I do think that it's Even in hard Bush's to... America, Megan? <laughs> Yeah, we might we might need to we might need to stage an armed uprising, Matt. I'll meet you down yes. at the Jefferson Memorial. We'll start with some dancing, and That's then right. uh, and then move on to liberating the the country in the name <laughs> of the people. Um, but I I so I think that actually it's harder to control an armed populace, right? Because there's a limit to actually how much force you can deploy when um, when the soldiers are afraid of people firing back, especially if the soldiers are part of the population that you're trying to control. So that's one thing. But I also think that there's um, there's a sort of dangerous idea about government in Western Europe that I don't like, which is like everything not compulsory is forbidden. Right. Um, and I think that that has been creeping in the in the U.S. and the gun control. I mean, there, I understand the what people thought was the good empirical argument for gun control. That seems not to have been borne out. I mean, the best you can say, I think, at this point is that if there is an increase in crime in, uh, as a result of these guns, it is too small to be detectable. Um, and that therefore the, the state shouldn't, without good reason, um, stop us from doing it because it, it just leads to the, what Joseph Schumpeter called people being state broken. The idea that the government has the idea, the right to tell you anything as long as your to do anything that it wants as long as your neighbors sort of disapprove. Um, and I also I also think that um, there there are great guns are a great equalizer for women. Um, right. you know, it's the, it's the only time I, I think every woman has had the experience once in her life, at least of being in a closed room with a guy and thinking, Oh my God, like if he wanted to rape me, there's nothing I could do about it. Um, and you know, the physical, the physical strength thing is real and it's the only weapon in which it's equally effective in the hands of, of, of a man and a woman. So I think there are a lot of reasons to, to sort of support this. Uh, I do worry about the, the, the lack of, uh, Easily accessorizable guns. So we were talking about this last night with a bunch right. of libertarian women. They're like, "There's very little in pink." Um, you know, the, one one of my commenters did have a funny comment. He said, "You know, a, a woman's gun wardrobe is clearly going to include at least two black guns that are to men superficially completely indistinguishable." Um, yes. Although, if you've ever fired a Glock, you'd know that there's uh, there's some design happening in that world. <laughs> I, I actually. Uh, went shooting, not for the first time, uh, but I think it was Brian Doherty's first time, and Brian Doherty, a senior editor of Reason, is uh, working on a book about the Heller case uh, that's going to be coming out this fall and has not been in today's L.A. Times about it. And I, I'm pretty sure I went with him for the first time shooting, and it was with Eugene Volokh, law professor from UCLA, uh, great on the First and Second Amendments. And uh, Eugene, of course, as you would imagine, gives a, you know, uh, a 25-minute lecture about the history of gun construction and gives us a long safety kind of thing. And then when uh, we actually went to the firing range, it was, uh, uh, it was appallingly evident that uh, there was a lot of theoretical libertarians in the room, <laughs> not necessarily uh, active firing uh, libertarians in the room. I'm interested in this whole thing as kind of a, um, in, in the politics of it, let's say, uh, you know, uh, Glenn Reynolds put, we had a, a forum on Reason today with uh, Glenn Reynolds and, and uh, uh, Dave Koppel and a bunch of other people, including on staff, talking about the various implications. He argued, Glenn did, that uh, this is going to be great for Obama uh, somehow uh, through a variety of logic. Though you can make an argument that it could be great for McCain because he could say to uh, NRA types and, and, uh, and uh, libertarians that, hey, look, you know, the, this is just a 5-4 majority. For me, the interesting political part is that this actually isn't, uh, I don't think, a huge case to the country at large to some degree. If this would have happened 15, 20 years ago, uh, you know, there'd be panic in the streets. There'd be every, you know, uh, editorial page would be in heavy breathing mode. This would be like a huge culture war movement. But I think what's happened over the last... 
15, 20 years. I mean, think about it. Who is the last Democratic nominee for president who hasn't had some kind of awkward, uh, you know, photo op uh, where he's hunting geese or otherwise carrying a gun? Hillary Clinton, for crying out loud, was like, a, you know, a gun-toting, whiskey-drinking uh, every man in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Um, clearly, the ground has shifted, and I think it's shifted in the direction of individual rights. And there's a great argument uh, that one can make that the Supreme Court is not at all really on the leading edge of society at any given time, and sort of rightly so. It's a lagging indicator, as is politics in general. Uh, the society moves a great deal in 20 years or 10 years, and the Supreme Court now, you know, the ground is sort of softened uh, up enough where... Uh, yeah, a, a knuckle-dragging right-winger like Antonin Scalia, as the media uh, tends to think of him, uh, can make a case for individual rights, and, you know, the republic survives. People don't panic or freak out about it. And uh, I think you see in a lot of lefty com commentary of, like, you know what? The D.C. gun ban was pretty ridiculous. <laughs> uh, it's kind of indefensible. And, uh, you know, if you look at the text of the Constitution, it's, you know, every other right is an individual right, as far as I know. Uh, or at least the preponderance are, and uh, it just seems like uh, this is not as radical as a decision uh, as as it would have been 10 or 15 years ago. I think there's one area in which the Supreme Court really has led the country and continues to lead the country, which is Roe. Um, I mean, I, th I think right. that the, the abortion law in the country is very far to the left of where the country at large is. I think that the country's consensus is that it should be illegal um, – you know, it should be legal in the first trimester and not after unless the life of the mother is endangered. Um, and the court has pretty much sort of kept the law to the left of that. And I think possibly because the court is a member of its class, and that, that class includes now a lot of professional women um, for whom abortion is a particularly salient issue, I think. Um, right. But I agree with you that in general the court doesn't lead the country. And I also think that, you know, there's been a political movement. We've had all of these this movement towards shell issue. And the republic hasn't fallen, and in fact, crime didn't spike, and none of the things that – it didn't really fall either, as John Lott had predicted. It just sort of kept grinding along in whatever direction it was heading. Um, and, you know, I think that the, the consensus is that, that guns aren't dangerous. What's dangerous is that the people that we have in cities, mostly, who use guns, and those are people who are disaffected – members of an underclass, fighting turf wars over drugs and so forth. And Europe is getting that. It's harder, you know, they're having a harder time controlling their borders and their gun violence is going up and ours is going down. Um, they, so have, uh, they have much, uh, I think at this point, dodgier ghettos than we do. Um, I think we have in general just sort of less ghettos uh, and in places like France, uh, you know, there are just sort of no-fly zones for the cops in ways that the, I think it's now becoming increasingly rare in the United States, and you know, when when there's no police presence in a high crime, high unemployment uh, area, that's uh, that's pretty bad news. That's actually an interesting thing to talk about because it so violates the perception. I mean, yesterday when I you know I, I blogged about Heller almost all day, and one of the things you know I've I have uh, several beloved liberal commenters, and one of them said, well, you know. Europe has lower rates of violent crime than we do, and they don't. They have higher rates of violent crime than we do. They have higher rates of all crimes than we do except murder. We, we're, we lead the, the world in murder, but and everything else, we're actually behind them. But there's this perception, right, that you are much safer in Europe. There's a perception that, um, that it's lower crime and so forth. And that's shared on both sides of the Atlantic. People here think that, lower, that Europe has lower crime, and people there – you know, how many – you must know people – you lived in France. I certainly knew people in London who would go to the U.S. for the first time and come back in shock that they hadn't been <laughs> sort of shot on the street several times. I mean, my uh, – actually, my own brother won't cross the uh, uh, west of the – or east of the Rockies because he's – he thinks that the entire country is uh, New York and <laughs> and it's all out to get him. And, of course, he lives in Long Beach, California, which is uh, <laughs> known as the LBC uh, in, uh, in other quarters. But, uh, no, that's very interesting. And uh, – and there is a sense – actually, I didn't live in France. My wife's French. I lived in uh, Eastern Europe, but I spent a, a hell of a lot of time there. And uh, the area of crime – it actually uh, – uh, Paris or parts of Paris remind me nothing more than of American cities in the 1970s. I mean, it's almost like – uh, you're just sort of screaming out for uh, Rudy Giuliani to, to come down. And, in fact, uh, Sarkozy is in many ways a uh, Giuliani uh, figure. He's uh, directly inspired by him. But the sense that you have is of a lot of young, bored men traveling in packs 
with uh, impunity and just sort of menacing people and grabbing asses and uh, and robbing people without any sense of that there's going to be uh, any problem unless there happens to be like an armed cop nearby and. I just can't help but wonder if that has uh, at least some effect. You had mentioned on your blog, and I, I, I either don't, didn't know or had forgotten this, that uh, you had been involved in some kind of uh, mugger foiling incident. Do, uh, do you wish to describe that uh, Yes, briefly? actually, it was with Dan Dresner, uh, who's a good friend, huh. as well as a blogging heads partner. And uh, he was in D.C., and I, had, I, have, I have a new apartment, which you've seen, uh, at uh, an unreasonable hour in the morning. <laughs> we don't need to talk about that. <laughs> Too much, but man, the uh, mac and cheese was really good. Go yeah, on. Matt, Matt, Matt paid uh, along with five other people an impromptu visit to my house at, at, at two in the morning. Uh, I think a few of those people cheese. were also name checked by David Brooks's column this morning. As yes, a of fact. Uh, I, I think just Julian Sanchez. Yeah, <laughs> um, I, 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 and, and this is here's a shout out to Julian Sanchez. It was all his fault. He was the one who suggested that I yes. would be more than happy to feed Matt and his friends. Yes, so anyway. Not that I wasn't more than happy, and I, I you know, I, any, anyone who's in D.C., feel free to drop in. Um, but so we were having dinner about five blocks from my house, and he hadn't seen my new apartment. So I said, oh, well, you know, come. he had to catch a plane in like 15 minutes. I said, oh, well, you know, come back and see it quickly before you go. So we were walking down U Street, and somewhere around like 14th Street, this guy started following us way too closely. And, it, you know, I'm, I'm from Manhattan, so I'm kind of used, you know, you have like the spidey sense that something's not right. Um, and so uh, I crossed U Street, we crossed U Street, he crossed U Street, still following us too closely. We crossed 15th Street, which is what I live on. He still, he crossed 15th Street, still following us too closely. And then Dan, who didn't know where he was going, kept walking down 15th Street. I turned onto you, Dan turned onto you, and then this guy, still following us way too closely, turns onto you as well. And tells us, and luckily I live, you know, sort of two doors off of U Street, which is an incredibly well-trafficked street and very light. Um, so I just dropped my bag on the ground and pretended to hunt for my keys. And it was actually very funny because this guy stood there for about 30 seconds huh. and then realized that there was no subtle way to continue standing directly behind us so that he could force us into my apartment building and rob us. Um, and he sort of very visibly, like, stabbed his foot and went, ah, oh! and then went <laughs> off. So. Um, That's really great. But, you know, and I, what I was saying about why gun statistics are so bad is that I didn't report that to pol- the police. What was I going to do? Right. Some tall, scary guys wandering around U Street maybe trying to mug people. Um, this is not exactly news to the D.C. police. Uh, so I didn't report that. And I'm sure if I'd waved a gun at him, I wouldn't report it either, especially if the gun were illegal. But and let me tell were, you from a personal experience, uh, when you are uh, mugged or at least, you know, menaced and robbed uh, at the threat of gunpoint, as I was in D.C. eight years ago, um, reporting it to the police is uh, they basically say, why are you bothering us? You know, there's too many of these things to really care about. But go well, this, on. This, was, this is interesting. I've actually I've, – I've, I've had – a attempted crime committed on me three times, once successfully, twice not. And each time what I've been amazed at is how stupid the criminals were. The first time there were two kids in Philadelphia who I scared off literally by assuming karate fighting stance and yelling <laughs> bonsai. And one of them said, oh, my God, she was karate and ran away. And I had no idea why I did this because I didn't know any right. of karate. All I knew was fighting stance and bond. So if they had said, no, really, give me your money, I'd have been like, okay, haha, just kidding. Here's my money. Um... The second time was a guy who – this is actually like – this is some sort of like libertarian hell. I was at the Bastiat dinner, which is a, a free market <laughs> economist famous for popularizing something called the broken windows fallacy. Um, while I was at the Bastiat dinner, which honors business journalists, um, someone broke my window and stole all my jewelry. <laughs> but uh, he in left your car or your uh, house? From my house. He uh-huh. left fingerprints everywhere. The cops – and the, this is the interesting thing is that New York 10 years ago, that's what I was expecting was to call and have them be like, oh, well, that's too bad. You know, call us if you catch the guy. <laughs> but instead, yeah. I had – within an hour, I had like 10 cops at my house taking fingerprints off the windows, looking for stuff around. They caught him. Um, he was a juvenile. I don't think he got punished very heavily. And they did not sadly recover any of the $10,000 worth of, you know, Ouch. inherited jewelry. Yeah, he stole – Inherited, yeah, it wasn't, sure, maybe. No, well, I, like it, it wasn't. None of it was terrifically valuable, but you know, I it was. But I have a lot of sort of elderly female relatives and not many uh, female cousins. Um, and the the terrible thing though was that you know a lot of the stuff was just stuff that had meaning to me. You know, like a uh, not particularly valuable ring that was my grandmother's and so forth. And he didn't get any money right. for it. He probably got, if anything, what like one hundred fifty, two hundred dollars for this. 
Um, and I lost a lot more money than that. The insurance didn't cover it. And also, but I lost things that I can't replace. Um, and then there was this third guy. So I asked my cousin, who is in fact getting her PhD in, in criminology, are all criminals stupid? <laughs> And she said, yes, if they weren't, you know, the hourly <laughs> wage is lower than like working at Popeye's. If they yeah. were smart, they would have a better job. Um, so, I mean, DC, I think, is, is sort of progressing slowly, slowly in the direction of New York in terms of having more presence of cops on the street, cracking down on yeah. stuff. Um, I mean, it's, uh, it's night and day from uh, when I first visited uh, the city, uh, which was uh, uh, basically on election night of 2000, uh, when I, and arguably America, uh, was mugged. Uh, uh, no, I was, uh, I was uh, going back to my hotel on uh, either Thomas Circle or Log- Logan Circle down uh, w- the Holiday Inn, which is right there, where you might be aware of. Um, and uh, that, at the time, was like a sketchy part of town. Uh, now, it, it, I think it clearly is not. And granted, it was at, uh, you know, 4 o'clock in the morning or whatever, but uh, uh, there, was a, the, there was kind of an open uh, sense of menace in the air uh, you know, east of whatever street uh, you you might name, and uh, now it's just night and day compared to that. Yeah, my mother lives on Logan Circle now, although she also pioneered, she lived on the, I grew up on the Upper West Side, which there were prostitutes on the corner of my street until, like, 1990, which I had no idea about. I didn't find this out until I was, like, 30, when, when a friend who'd grown up in the same building sort of offhandedly mentioned it, and I was like, really? <laughs> um, but actually, I think this is probably a good segue to talk a little, when, what you say about Bush, um, you know, I, I'm certainly no supporter of Bush either, but I, and, and I'm not, I, neither of us are fans of McCain, but I have to say that Heller gave me pause because it was essentially uh-huh. a political decision. Um, you know, if, if we had had John Kerry in office, Heller would have gone the other way. Well, I think the, uh, that's an interesting uh, way of looking at it. And certainly a lot of people will, a lot of libertarians who have voted Republican over the years, but are getting sketchy and considering Bob Barr this year or otherwise feeling disaffected by uh, either McCain or just kind of like the tired husk of the Republican Party, which is something that you just feel in the air here in Washington, I think. Um, maybe those people suddenly have a moment of, uh, of oh, wait a second. Uh, from my standpoint, I would be more convinced on that line if uh, Scalia had voted the right way in the Rach case uh, in uh, uh, allowing uh, states uh, and allowing uh, you know, medical marijuana patients in California uh, to uh, to enforce that law as they see fit, instead of having some kind of bogus commerce clause reach into uh, you know uh, crime fighting. I mean, it, there's a, a think a semi persuasive argument that Scalia has really strong principles, unless it just happens to be on the wrong or right side of his sort of sense of of uh, crime and punishment and culture war. And you see that on his. Uh, feverish dissent that he had on the, uh, and I'm going to mangle the pronunciation, Bormadine case uh, recently in which he just basically said, hey, look, we can't be uh, granting habeas uh, corpus rights to people who are detained in Guantanamo because it's going to make America less safe. And um, that doesn't seem to me a very highly uh, jurisprudential uh, analysis, among other things. And I think on on issues of executive power, which are issues that I care pretty deeply about, uh, Scalia is not my friend. He's, uh, generally speaking, my enemy. And uh, Roberts is, it's kind of unclear exactly where he stands. And so um, and at, at this moment in history, I think that we have had, you know, uh, eight years of a very deliberately sort of expansionist um, uh, sense of the presidency. And this was happening uh, long before September 11th. There was a, um, you know, Cheney and Rumsfeld come from the uh, Ford administration, and they were right there at like the at ground zero of uh, the Democratic and just sort of national backlash against executive power overreach. And they set about very deliberately beforehand, and, and they were telegraphing their moves of we need to restore the executive back uh, to its you know sort of proper balance, um, which is something that you also heard hear about and heard about at the time and less so now, but it's definitely part of his whole philosophy from John McCain. I mean, he, uh, his books, which are the main source of my book, uh, about him, uh, are not filled much with any kind of sense of his political philosophy. He's really disinterested in it. He just sort of described himself as a sort of default Reagan Republican, uh, and beyond that, you know, he's, he's talking about individual issues that he cares about much more than, uh, uh, say, you know, a, a grounded sense of philosophy about the proper role of government, yada, yada. 
But there's one exception to that rule. Now, there's a couple of exceptions, but the main exception is he believes that the executive branch has lost too much power, especially in the waging of war and the conduct of foreign policy and its ability to scale back the excesses of Congress. Um, that is the kind of precedent that, that I'm convinced that he would be. And so when he gets around to appointing judges, and who knows what he's going to do. A lot of conservatives hate his guts because of the uh, Gang of 14 compromise, uh, and, uh, and I don't know exactly what his values are, but uh, I have no reason to believe that he wouldn't be appointing people who have his expansionist views of executive power, and that, to me, might be more important than the uh, demerits of uh, Obama uh, uh, appointing someone who would be much more in favor of sort of New Deal economic uh, regulation type of things, but who would uh, most likely be more likely to uh, to go after overreach in places like Guantanamo and executive secrecy and these kind of things. But I should preface all of that by saying I am uh, I just have never belonged to a political party, and so I'm kind of. I don't hear the dog whistle that goes off when people say, Supreme Court, Supreme Court, you got to vote for, you know, X party. I just, it, it doesn't have any effect on me. And that could be a uh, intellectual failing as much as anything else. Well, I've, there's a huge amount to unpack there. So I'm, I'm going to start off by going back to something you said, which I think is, I mean, I, I'm certainly not the first person to say this, but I think it's extraordinary the extent to which we are refighting the damn Nixon administration, right? Like this yes. is, this is just ultimately about a battle that, in, and it almost makes you wish the bastard hadn't been impeached so that we didn't have to have all of these um, these stupid attempts to, you know, restore the executive presidency, which I, I completely agree with you. And, it, it, and I, I also want to say, A, there's no way I'm going to vote for John McCain. B, I mean, I'm sort of at the point now where I'm like, okay, well, at least we got Heller out of Bush. Now time to not have Bush. Um, and so are I, you an Obamacon? <laughs> are we getting you on record right now? Um, I'm a half Obamacon. Um <laughs> I will vote either for Bob Barr or Barack Obama. I will not vote for John McCain. Um, and I, I think that we should probably go into this a lot because you're, you're sort of like the world's leading libertarian expert on him. Uh, and, and in fact, I think that some of, you know, I don't know, shaped isn't the right word because I sort of felt this way before, but I feel like you've consolidated a lot of thoughts I had about, I don't feel like the man has a political philosophy. I mean, I, I think to the extent that he has a political philosophy, it's sort of like the superhero philosophy of government, uh -huh. which is that there are bad, you know, the problem is not with the power. The problem is that the bad people have it. And we need like arch, arch superhero John McCain to go in and pow, 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 kick them in the head, shove, shove the bad guys out of power and restore justice and right to the world. Um, and I, you know, and it's sort of weird side note. One of my one of my liberal commenters, who I adore, whose name is Freddie, um, is, you know, he uh, he yelled at me yesterday in my comments. And then when I I did a, I do buy request threads on Thursdays so people can ask me to blog about things. And he said his his request was, "Who's worse, Robert Mugabe or Freddie?" Um, so I said, uh, <laughs> "He really he's he's adorable." Um, Hi, Freddie. Um, but so he. Um, I wrote a, th a post saying, well, my, my money is on Mugabe, but of course, he's never, Freddie has never been the dictator of a, a moderately prosperous African nation, so we really need a control study. And actually, my former co-blogger, Mindel Strack, came in and said, you know, this is the thing, is that it, it's surprising to find so many people here who understand that, in fact, it's hard to tell what people are like when they're not dictators and that the power is the problem, that, that he, he is an acquaintance who's quite close to Mobutu. And said that he was one of so the, the most power, charming, it, the power warm is the men enabler of the uh, per personality, basically, right? So you, yeah. you you see the manifestation because of the power more than uh, otherwise. My fundamental problem is not with the people. I mean, the people who hold it can be bad, and they can make certainly make things worse and do better or worse things with the power. But my feeling is that it's just dangerous to give people power, and that we should try not to give them power as much as possible. Um, which is why I completely agree with you on the executive privilege stuff is that um, I would like Congress not to have the power either. I would like um, – and I think that, you know, in a lot of the things – you know, right after 9-11, I was certainly more willing to give the Bush administration room. But at this point, you know, you've had people in Guantanamo for seven years. What are you planning to do with them? Um, right. If they don't have habeas rights, you've got to do something. You know, forget whether – it's almost forget whether or not they have habeas rights. You can't just hold people indefinitely without – some public process for figuring out whether they belong there or not. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it, what – And it's legal... almost it's, – it's almost – well, it is. It's amazing that we have to say that. Yeah. It's amazing. I feel like as a libertarian, 
it is amazing to me that in the United States, I have to say, you know, we shouldn't have prisons where there's no process for for getting out of the prison. And I understand national intelligence and so forth. And, you know, I think that as a country, we actually, in part because the Bush administration has overreached so much, we haven't had the conversation we needed to have, which is we're in a unique situation. We have people who are non-state actors who consider themselves to be at war with the United States. And so all of the Geneva procedures that are set up for dealing with, with, you know, sort of declared wars between states don't work very well. And we need to, we need to work through the process. But what we've had instead is a screaming match over um, on the one hand, whether you're just allowed to detain people indefinitely um, and whether torture is an appropriate interrogation method um, and on the other hand, you know, people saying Geneva, 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 and Geneva, I don't think works very well here. And I know that there are some scholars who are having this conversation, but I think as a public conversation, it hasn't happened because the focus has been so much on, um, you know, the Bush administration's vast overreach. And if they had gone for sort of having, you know, pushing like a coherent national debate about this, um, we would be in a much better position to discuss what do you do with people who, if you release them, may go on to commit terrorist acts, you know, who consider themselves to be at war, but we don't have any way to end, to undeclare the war in some way um, yeah. and to say it's over. Like, that's a really complicated question. And I think that the people who are just screaming Geneva over and over again at the top of their lungs are not giving that nearly enough discussion. And that's why people on the other side are sort of able to dismiss them. I think on both sides, there's been a lot of, and bad faith is the right word, just a lot of short-sighted sort of, um, you know, international law is not yet a reality. We have to talk about this as a country, not, you know, what does France want us to do? Yeah, um, I mean, I think I think that the, uh, you know, uh, unfortunately asking for, you know, politicians to uh, spearhead a rational public and national conversation is a, is asking for much when they're when they're uh, also in the business of winning and and in this year right. uh, losing elections uh, unfortunately and I think there's also uh, sometimes that whole like uh, let's have an adult conversation is uh, is sort of centrist ease for uh, you know let's let's dream up a rationalization for torture. I mean, if you look at what the, the rational conversations or those who were uh, claiming it in 2003 were talking about, I mean, Alan Dershowitz was like, hey, torture is good. Mark Bowden, who wrote a fantastic uh, piece about this, I believe it was in The Atlantic, uh, nonetheless, it moved things in that direction. It, it set up this phony balance, and I, and I, I, uh, I think it's one of the most phony balances uh, in the, the national rhetoric between liberty and security, um, as if uh, you know, it's a scale, and if you drop, um, take off some pieces from one end of the scale, the other one automatically goes up or down. Uh, and, you know, if that was the case, the most uh, secure countries in the world would be the most uh, dictatorial, and they are inherently unstable. And we're damned secure, and we're a pretty free and open society compared to the rest of the world. Um, but I want to uh, challenge you on this uh, one one idea, uh, which is that you say, rightfully so, that you don't want uh, you you don't think that it's a great idea to concentrate power in the hands of uh, one person or necessarily one party. But uh, as a half Obamacon. Um, Democrats are going to gain in the Senate and in the House almost assuredly, um, uh, and they probably will gain in a bunch of state houses as well. Uh, Obama would threaten to be running a unified government, and last time we had a unified government, it uh, didn't work out so well on the Republican side. And I would worry about, and I realize this might sound contrary to my critique of McCain, uh, but I would worry about what happens, what are the Democrats sitting around and rubbing their hands about? I mean, uh, they want to institute card check, making it vastly easier for uh, unions to organize in ways that are uh, that are frankly uh, uh, disturbing and I think kind of undemocratic. Um, I think that the general rhetoric of the election from Obama, from Clinton, from commentators on the left uh, has, uh, they've moved to the economic left by uh, several strides, it, it occurs to me. I mean, um, compared to Kerry in 04, even Howard Dean in 04, um, you're seeing pretty much open hostility to uh, free trade, for example. Uh, in Obama's uh, race speech, which I uh, was one of those who thought it was a pretty great speech and very interesting, certainly, and, and an attempt to have an adult conversation, uh, as, as we all like to put it. Um, but even in that thing, he was saying, you know, look, we're all... 
you know, these divisions between us are phony. What uh, we all agree on is that we're feeling destabilized by all those damn Indians who have jobs in Bangalore. And it's like, wow, do you realize what you just did there? Um, I'm worried about that, uh, uh, and, uh, and aren't you worried about that kind of consolidation of power of what uh, Democrats have cooking up uh, for, you know, November 10th or whatever the date is? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I should say, like, when I say I'm half an Obamacon, I really... I don't, I don't even think it's probably P equals 50 that I vote for Obama, precisely for the reasons that you're talking about. It's, and it's not just the concentration of power, because I, I feel like you know Clinton had it briefly, Bush had it briefly, and they tend to lose it because people like divided government. Yeah. Um, that said, uh, I am worried about a lot of the things that Obama I, – I, you know, I, like I like Obama a lot for a Democrat. Um, but I don't like Democrats that much. I don't like Republicans that much either. I'm a liber that's why I'm a libertarian. Um, are you a member of the the LP or are you no, an independent or Republican? I, uh, I'm not registered as anything. I just you know I'm an independent. I guess uh, I register. I vote in national elections, but I don't vote in primaries. Um, and Me too. yeah, see this is the, this is the, this is the thinking man's position. Um, <laughs> although a lot of libertarians don't vote at all, which I find kind of odd because most of them do actually have preferences, right? You know, like most most of the libertarians I know right now are against McCain. Not all of them, certainly, but most of the people who I, I know who, like, sort of hardcore identify with the movement are against McCain, and then they say they won't vote. It's like, well, you already have a preference. You might as well express it, right? Well, um, the idea is that you're giving legitimacy to the system, comma, man, which <laughs> I find, at least, uh, if it's not persuasive, at least it's humorous, but uh, I'm a serial like voter myself. I feel like you give legitimacy to the system every time you pay your parking tickets. Um, That's true. So it's, you know, this seems like le – and also, like, you're giving legitimacy to the system. What, do you not think we should vote? Should we have some other means of organizing society? Um, but I think that um, my, my problem with McCain, right, is that what is he going to stand against – okay, so, you know, we can delineate the areas where I support McCain over Obama and the areas where I support Obama over McCain. Um I, why, you know, where, where do, where does McCain differ from the Democrats in ways that I care about? Okay, so he's going to point, uh, Supreme Court justices. What are the issues that I really care about on the Supreme Court now? Like, I think Roe was a terrible law. I think it should be struck down. I'm pro choice, though, and it's not, it's not a huge item on my agenda either way. Um, right. So, you know, what are, what, what's left? I mean, Heller really mattered. And I think yeah. that, you know, there, there's something to be said for the fact that there are going to be more of these cases litigated in the last, in the next years, because already this morning someone filed a gun ban against, uh, a lawsuit against a city gun ban in the wake of this. Right. Um, so that matters, I think. And I would not like to see an Obama appointed judge immediately claw this back. Um, on the other hand, you know, the, the conservative justices on the court are now young enough that they w will probably be able to last at least four years. Uh, without retiring, and you know, as soon as o as soon as Obama gets in, a bunch of older Democratic justices are going to retire, and you know, because th they've been hanging on like you know by the claws, their fingernails, just desperately waiting for a Democratic president to come in. Um, but McCain, in many ways, right? He's simply yeah, he's good on trade. I give him total props for going out and you know being brave on trade and saying you know no no no, yeah. um, and he's good on immigration. So I. Ah. He's, he's good. His heart is good on immigration. Uh, I, you know, he also thinks that it's a great idea to have you know, an e-verify system or a national ID card or a bunch of other things that I think are pretty awful. And I'm not, you know, the uh, comprehensive immigration reform. The best thing that you can say about its proponents, I think, uh, and McCain in particular, is that in some, you know, uh, vague and, and mushy way. Um, his heart was in the right place, but I think that would have been a terrible law, actually, the thing that, that finally came out of all the various compromises and committees. Um, so I'm not, I'm not convinced. I mean, one problem with him is that uh, he gets very excited about individual issues, and depending on the legislation that's produced by it, can be your best friend on that issue if it happens to line up with yours. But uh, many of the reforms that he's come up with, by the time it gets out in practice, and granted this is kind of common in the United States Senate, but uh, become a mess, um, and uh, and certainly we've seen that with McCain-Feingold, regardless of uh, you know uh, constitutional issues, which are the most important ones to me. But uh, that it, it just the devil's in the details, and he's terrible at details. But go on. Well, and I, I also think that you know he he does a lot of things that really disturb me, like pharma bashing. He's obsessed with the pharmaceutical companies. He hates them. Right. It's actually interesting who was getting all the money from the insurance companies this round, right? It, and, and the pharma 
lobbies. It was uh, first Hillary and then Obama. McCain was getting nothing because he hates the healthcare companies. And his position on it is that these guys, you know, these guys are, they're evil and they're screwing us and, and they really need, they really need superhero John McCain to go and kick some people in the head. I mean, um, he said the same thing about, uh, about oil speculators. Uh, you know, right. we need to, we need to put an end to this, this sort of nefarious activity. He really demonized them uh, in, in a language that would just be perfect in a, you know, a Parisian newspaper circa 1900 talking about rapacious uh, capitalists, but it doesn't show a whole lot of respect for, let alone knowledge of the way that markets work. <laughs> he, is uh, the, he is the living reincarnation of Theodore Roosevelt. He is a national greatness populist. And this is like everything I hate about the Republican Party. And also in a lot of ways, I feel like he's actually got, you know, if you have a Republican president who is going to collude with the Democrats to destroy the pharmaceutical industry um, in the name of the American people, uh, that's more dangerous than Obama, right? Like, Obama has some checks on him, which is that everyone thinks he's a pinko liberal, and so he can't look like too much of a pinko liberal. Um, uh, McCain has no such checks. When McCain tells you that the pharmaceutical companies are evil villains who need to be destroyed, people, oh, well, he's a Republican. If, if even he knows that, then obviously they actually need to be destroyed. And I actually, I, like, this is actually one of my key issues, because I, I think that America is the country in the world right now that is providing all of the the profits that drive pharma research, um, and if we destroy that, it's not coming back. You know, if we if we manage to to take these companies out and drive down their profits to the point where they don't do a lot of new R and D, the entire world suffers. Um, right. So you know that that's a key issue for me, and he's terrible on it. Um, you know, more broadly, I think that. He, even more than Obama, I felt like he and Hillary Clinton were both sort of national greatness people, and their vision of, in different ways, but they had a common vision of America as, like, what we all really want to be is, like, a cell in a body. And we're all just working together towards, and, and that's, we get, we, we are, trend, you know, we're transformed and transcended of ourselves by participating in this vast, large project of whatever the body happens to be doing. And so, you know, when he says things like, I support national service. Now, I, in fact, um, you know, I, I have, my mom's from a small town, and I actually, I celebrate the values that cause people to join the military and serve. And I think it's a, a phenomenal thing to do, and I think that, it's sad that the that coastal culture denigrates that so much, which it does. Um, but I think that it can't be instilled in people. You can't make people be patriotic. They either are or they aren't. And forcing them to serve, you know, sort of fundamentally is against everything I believe about America. Um, but it's also, it's counterproductive. You know, putting, putting people into some sort of national service program is going to make them love their country more. It's just going to, um, you know, take two years of their lives and, and give us all this false sense that we're in a collective project that people don't feel. Well, I mean, Obama is a huge National Service fan himself. He gave a speech uh, like a month ago at Wesleyan College uh, that, uh, where he was subbing out for Teddy Kennedy. And, uh, and he talked about, I mean, the speech was almost indistinguishable from a classic John McCain 2000 speech or John McCain when he goes in front of, like, the Naval Academy this year in which he talks about, like, uh, the, the best way that you can live your life as an American is if you uh, subsume yourself within a national service, is if you don't become one of those corporate lawyers, you know, avoid that temptation and go out there and do some community organizing and, and volunteer and join the government and all this kind of stuff. Um, it's uh, it's interesting to me, and I think it's probably one of the reasons that they're both, in some ways, attractive to a lot of people. Because I think people have a uh, sort of a, an openness in their heart, for lack of a better word, for that kind of rhetoric. The same rhetoric that sort of makes my skin crawl. Um, but uh, uh, Obama is hitting that uh, message really hard this year. And this year, unlike 2000, uh, people are kind of believing it from him, and they're not really taking it as much from McCain because they've seen McCain now for more than 10 years on the national scene. He's flip-flopped a lot. He has given a lot of awkward speeches, like his terrible uh, New Orleans uh, speech. Uh, and uh, and so it just the, those words seem a little bit tired coming out of his mouth. But I'm hearing the same thing out of uh, Obama. It's just sort of beautiful, lofty service. We're all going to put our shoulder to the wheel. Uh, you know, we're going to get that health care and get those jobs all together as part of this grand uh, American experiment. And on a, on a good day when the wind is blowing in the right direction, it sounds good to my ears too, but it's the same sort of call of like, 
the presidency as the you know source or the organizer of national salvation and a kind of a, a re-energizing uh, and remoralization of uh, of the country based from the bully pulpit of the White House. And uh, you know I think Gene Healy's uh, book and and, uh, and the version that he wrote for us uh, uh, in the magazine, The Cult of the Presidency, speaks to that, and it also speaks to the fact that a, a lot. One of the biggest reasons for this, like, yeah, yeah, there's this whole sort of Nixon administration thing and, and many other aspects, but a large part of it is just that Americans have uh, have created demand. They were expressed demand for that type of salvation coming from the White House. And, you know, I think it's on on many levels just sort of creepy. You know, I think the founders were onto something with the whole idea about the private pursuit of happiness. Um, which is an explicit clause that McCain has attacked. And, uh, and Obama, I don't know if he's attacked it explicitly, but he's a big, you know, sort of communitarian too. Uh, and it's an interesting choice that we have. I mean, thankfully, they are different significantly on issues that matter, like foreign policy and economics. And I, and I think uh, largely McCain is much better uh, than Obama merely for the fact of giving good lip service about trade, if nothing else. Um, I think McCain is just as much of a regulator as uh, Obama is, and uh, arguably more. Um, and but it's also important, I think, to point out that no matter who's president, uh, we're going to have like a cap and trade system by December or uh, January or something like that. There are a series of issues on which McCain is definitely going to be working directly with a Democratic Congress, who's going to be sort of newly energized and have a, an agenda that's been sitting around waiting to go for more than eight years now. There are two things I actually want to I want to ask you about. The first I I think is something that it's really why are we in this moment? I was talking to Jacob Levy I don't know three or four months ago about because he work, does a lot of work on liberalism and how in a lot of ways liberalism lost right in the 30s you had the progressive movement basically everyone you know liberalism was in some way discredited and and everyone wanted some sort of political system whether it was communist or fascist that was going to catch them up in this great machinery of the state and push them forward into the future. And, you know, for the last 15 years, we've been hearing about how this is libertarianism's moment and so forth. But it does seem to me that we're, we're, we're moving backwards that, you know, I, I do feel like the, the idea of individual liberty and the idea of the importance of emergence and spontaneous order um, and letting people be as much as possible was gaining popularity for a long time and that we're now regressing, that people are looking to experience some sort of transcendent being through the expression of the government. And I, uh, why is a, that? I make a distinction here. Uh, on one sense, you're right, maybe on the kind of political rhetoric, rhetoric sense, the governance sense, certainly the, the size of the government continues to grow apace and, and grew much faster under uh, George W. Bush than any president since Lyndon Johnson. Uh, and the appetite seem, for government seems undiminished. And, you know, you have all these uh, uh, great, uh, you know, new books coming out by your uh, fellow dynamic new uh, right-leaning writers uh, who are all talking about, like, Look, uh, the era of limited government is over, and we need to reach out and uh, to the working class and give them little goodies and things like that. And if the Republicans have given up that fight. Uh, who who's out there left? So that's on one hand, it's troubling. It's there, uh, but there's a huge other hand. Um, that other hand says that the Republican Party and the Democratic Party are losing market share uh, and have been steadily since 1972. Especially the Democrats over the long haul but certainly the Republicans over the short term. What has been gaining market share? Freaks like you and me, who don't belong to a political party, who pick and choose, who cross aisles, ignore them, um, who enjoy you know, a, a freewheeling life with its you know, ups and downs. You and I have both been freelance journalists, so we certainly have known the taste of store-bought macaroni and cheese. <laughs> Despair. Um, but uh, who embrace the kind of lifestyle and uh, job opportunities and mobility that the new technologies and the newly free world since 1989 have coughed up. And so I argue, uh, and Nick Gillespie and I have done this in various formats, that there is a libertarian moment happening. It's just outside of politics for the most part. Even within politics, it is interesting to note that you know one of the two or three kind of uh, political candidacies for presidents that caught fire in an interesting way was Ron Paul. And Ron Paul, uh, you know, who's a, a sort of a radical libertarian, uh, he kept 
repeating the message, I don't want to uh, run your life. Um, and I think that appealed to a, a huge number of people, and they weren't just old Republicans who were pissed off. Uh, there are a lot of young people, a lot of anti-war people, certainly, but it, the message spoke to people. I think Bob Barr is obviously going to be you know, getting more votes than any libertarian uh, party candidate since 1988, and, and for the first time since then, you know, the LP is definitely the third party. So there is some political expression of this that resonates with people. But more importantly, we're living in a world where everyone, for example, totally enjoys uh, and, and uh, takes tangible value from the kind of freedoms that you get on the Internet. Um, in fact, I mean, that's something that both you and I know as well. Just by the mere fact of going up and opening up stupid blogger software, you and I both changed our professional lives. Now, granted, we're not every man. We're not anything like it. But um, people are out there. They're, uh, they're, uh, they're sort of involved in the long tail of, of both uh, economic and, to some degree, political activity. They're, they're finding ways to you know, leave their hometown by staying in their bedroom, uh, which is a pretty radical and fantastic thing. And I think that even if they might not be uh, have their own philosophical names attached to it, the basic sort of broad concepts and technological realities behind that are things that people inherently love. And any politician that treads on that and, and uh, goes back and decides that we need to re-regulate the Internet, that we need to you know, uh, impose sales taxes and uh, state to uh, bought goods over the Internet or, or some other aspects of, uh, of modern life that we're all enjoying, they're going to get a terrific momentary uh, backlash. And so, I mean, th this group, the group of people uh, that is the only group of people that is growing in American politics are independents. They're people like you and me who don't belong to a political party and who seek their interest, their salvation, their whatever they want to do elsewhere and away from politics. Politics is the ultimate lagging indicator. We have two parties from the damn 19th century right now, so why are, you know, it's amazing that we're still talking about them, but that's not the future. I think that there's the sense among the private population of, look, just leave me alone, let me do uh, what, what I want to do and get on with my life, um, and, uh, and that that will eventually maybe translate into politics or maybe not. Most importantly, it's gained a really strong foothold in the culture itself making us a more free, more dynamic, and more lastingly free and dynamic society. That's my optimistic. Well, I think what's interesting is how unsettled people, you know, I mean, you and I both, I, I certainly, I, I think we're probably both glad to be on salary with health insurance and so forth now. <laughs> um, <laughs> I sure known beats both... uh, trying to apply to uh, health insurance when you're healthy and 30 and being told that you're too unhealthy to, uh, to get any. Yeah, well, and I lived in New York where the insurance market is so regulated that uh, there's community pooling and so forth. So the only HMO I could get cost $450 a month for a healthy, non-smoking woman in her 20s. Um, yeah. It was it was crazy. So, of course, I didn't have, have health insurance. Um, but in, And I, too, have known the taste of both despair and ramen and cheese doodle surprise. Um, <laughs> it's really not so bad if you use, like, the vanilla soy milk. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I, I think what's interesting is that there's a feeling, you know, you and I have capitalized on this. And in fact, people at The Economist, when I started there, nicknamed me Ms. Zitgeist because uh, I had managed to, in the 90s, work for startups, all of, almost all of which blew up. In the, at the end of the decade, just as the bubble was popping, go to business school, get fired from a management consulting company during the recession, work at, you know, work at the World Trade Center, and then end up as a blogger and a journalist. Um, and you had a similar, you know, you, you were in Eastern Europe in the 90s when, when it's sort of like there are these cities that it, at various times in the world see, it seem to, like, take over. You know, like in the 20s, everyone was living in a big one-bedroom house somewhere in Paris. Um, and, uh, now it's, and, and in the nineties, everyone I knew who was anyone was, was going off to Eastern Europe to have an adventure. Um, so you've had a sort of similar experience, I feel like of, of having this kind of random wandering life that is somehow found us, uh, in our, in our near middle age, um, as internet barons. Um, I mean, and, and let's, let's uh, pay homage to what made that possible. One obviously was the uh, end of the cold war, which is is still, uh, you know, the most fantastic event of our lifetimes and, and strangely Go under Reagan. acknowledged. 
<laughs> yeah, go Reagan. Um, I mean, uh, no, I, 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 I said it before, but, uh, you know, at the time when he said tear down this wall, I was like 17 or 19 or something, and I mocked him, and, and uh, that's uh, the, I, I still feel guilty about that. Um, but also cheap air travel, you know, which is something that's right now there's, there's actual talk about re-regulating the airlines. There's an atrocious column in the Washington Post by David Ignatius uh, arguing that, oh, you know, air travel is obviously broken. Uh, deregulation helped nobody. I mean, what, what are you even talking about, dude? Um, and so, therefore, we need to re-regulate. But so these things uh, allowed it to happen, and the uh, proliferation of the Internet allowed this to happen. So, I mean, things that were momentous uh, events for freedom allowed uh, us to taste, you know, taste the beautiful boot of uh, poverty and wanderlust and adventure and whatever and find 17 different jobs and eventually settle into ones that uh, hopefully will last longer than six months. Uh, well, I mean, I actually, like, I have the perfect job. I have, like, I have such a great life that every morning I wake up and I'm like, seriously? Um, people pay me to do this, but uh, don't don't tell that to my editor, though. Um, no, I should no, continue no. being paid. Um, but But I think that there's a flip side is that, People feel more insecure, even though, in fact, they're not. I mean, this is the weird thing, right? People are more concerned. People are really obsessed with losing their health insurance. Well, if you're a native-born American, you are more likely to have health insurance now from the latest day that we have than you were in 1982. And your health insurance is more generous. Uh, you, were, you have lower deductibles, et cetera, et cetera. But people feel like it's not. People feel like it used to be. And, and in fact, all of the in- increase comes from immigration. It's people who are new to the country who are likely to be, who are more likely to be uninsured. There are still about... Uh, 12 to 15 percent of native-born Americans are uninsured, but that is the same number that it was in 1982. But people feel like it's changed, and people feel. But like I mean, if it was if secure. it was crappy in '82, uh, you know, it's still crappy in 2008, and maybe we're more aware of uh, places where it might be crappy, but at least you have insurance and you don't have to worry about uh, the effect of changing a job or, more importantly, living this sort of, uh, you know, uh, lifetime freelance lifestyle uh, and being able to get health insurance. I mean, in, in Los Angeles, where I just moved from, you know, the whole city, or at least, you know, the strip around uh, the, the Hollywood Hills, uh, is based on sort of ad hoc uh, collections of people working on projects. And so you're a freelancer by definition, and it's not very easy, as you know, as a freelancer, to get health insurance in our bizarre system. And so I kind of understand that sense of insecurity, even if the numbers are, you know, flatlining from one year to another. And, um, and I think it's because that that hasn't been... Uh, that sense of insecurity and the political ramifications of it haven't been dealt with in any useful way uh, in that intervening period that we're now at a moment where there is at least a democratic consensus and, you know, maybe uh, McCain can be persuaded to go along with it to some degree that we need the government to get involved in a universal health care scheme um, and, uh, and who knows how that's going to go, but Based on the the ones that have been tried in various states, um, you know, I don't have a lot of faith that that's going to uh, turn out well. No, I think it, it probably isn't, and I think that you know the problem with McCain is that, in some sense, his heart is in the right place. He's trying to break the link between employers and and health insurance, which is just stupid, and it's a legacy. Which is totally crucial, yes. Um, but I don't think it's going to work. I mean, I think in fact, you know, the insurance market for employers is well developed. There's a social expectation that you will get health insurance from your employer. So I'm not sure how much it will change the market, even if, if, even if he gets, ends up doing this sort of tax credit thing that he's interested in doing. But I do want to, I, I think before we finish up, I, I think we should talk about cap and trade because I think that that is a huge thing. Um, and I'm, I, you know, I don't know what your stance, I'm actually like, I, as a sort of good uh, economic negative externality person, I am in favor of pricing in the negative externalities of carbon. I'm convinced that global warming is an issue. Um, what I'm interested in is how do you do this efficiently and well. And I have to say that on both, I think we're going to get cap and trade, and I think it's a bad idea. I think it's going to be badly implemented, and I think, A, it's not going to make a difference. I don't think that it's going to substantially actually reduce net emissions. Um, I think it's going to be expensive. I think it's going to be prone to a lot of rent-seeking. Um, and I think that both plans are flawed in their own ways. I mean, John McCain, part of my problem with John McCain, among my many problems with John McCain, is that when he talks about so many economics issues, he manages to come off like a total idiot. I mean, his, <laughs> Doug Holt Aiken, is, his advisor, is a great guy. Um, right. And, you know, but he, he sounded surprised when he discovered that, yes, you would have to have a hard cap for cap and trade to work. 
which, yeah. you know, made him sound just not quite bright. And um, you'd, you'd also have to have a uh, intrusive kind of a measuring system yeah. that has never been produced. It's never even been proposed, um, which is the one of the biggest reasons why it, uh, it's a failure in Europe. Uh, is that basically companies are encouraged to sort of self-report and, uh, and you know, countries themselves are sort of incentivized to, uh, to, to uh, fudge the numbers. And there's just incentives up and down the scheme to not have an honest and transparent market. Uh, so it doesn't work. It hasn't worked anywhere so far. Uh, and I don't see any uh, suggestion or proposed reforms that would make it work. And so to introduce a huge new regulation of unclear, you know, uh, even uh, stated impact uh, that, uh, that is using things that have been proven not to work is a recipe for disaster, I think. And, I mean, I'm a, we just had a big uh, uh, forum feature that uh, uh, talked about uh, global warming, basically kind of like do nothing or like get out, deregulate or cap and trade, or uh, carbon tax. And our science correspondent, Ron Bailey, who has sort of uh, uh, noisily uh, uh, gone from being a big uh, global warming uh, skeptic to one who believes that there is man-made global warming and that it's a, an issue that should be dealt with, uh, he's come out in favor of a carbon tax uh, now. I see the uh, argument for it, uh, certainly, um, which is just, you know, that is the best way to price that externality. Um, slap a tax on it. Um, who knows what you do with that money? Maybe you throw it all to some boondoggle development uh, research program so that snails can, you know, defecate uh, pure energy molecules. Um, uh, I don't know. I'm not convinced necessarily that that's the best thing to do. Um, you know, I think that we could start with a lot of sort of sensible deregulation of the power industry. I mean, the electricity industry is one of the worst. Uh, I mean, the, the grid is a disaster. There's no sense of efficiency about it at all. Um, I mean, I would start with what government already controls, make that better, and then let's get talking. Uh, but that said, I don't have a, a, a clear and fast thing. Aside from that, cap and trade is a disaster. And most likely, I think that the solution um, to, uh, you know, weaning ourselves off fossil fuels is going to come from things like nanotechnology. It's going to come from uh, crazy science that we can't imagine right now. And 10 years from now, we're going to look back at this conversation and say, what were we even talking about? Um, but again, I'm, uh, I'm optimistic by nature. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm an optimist too, but in, in this way, like I think that um, I think that I agree with you. The cap and trade, a cap and trade system. First of all, the monitoring is a huge problem. The second problem is that um, if it does not include international emissions, right? If it doesn't include, if we can just import carbon-intensive goods from China, it's not very effective. And all we've done is add the fuel cost of transporting them. Um, and third, if we do include what uh, most of these plans do, which is international offsets where you can go to China and pay them to shut down a polluting factory. Well, the monitoring for this is ridiculous. Um, and also, you're creating a market for polluting factories to be shut down, right? I mean, you're encouraging people to keep open old and efficient plants so that someone will eventually pay them to shut them down. You're possibly including them, encouraging them to build those plants so that people will shut them down. So it's not at all clear that you get any net carbon reduction. Um, I think it's a, a big boondoggle um, and ends up just being an opportunity for rent-seeking. A tax, what, what I would say is that, you know, we have basically sort of four carbon fuel sources, tax those. We know how many, we know how much carbon is contained in each of those things. You know, if you want to certify that you've uh, done X, Y, or Z to capture that carbon and sequester it, and you can certify that, um, because coal sequestration can be, you know, carbon sequestration from coal can be observed and certified and so forth, then you can get a rebate. But I, th I, th I think the way that you do is you, you just tax that, you tax the fuel source. Um, because I think that the innovations are not going to come from some big government Manhattan Project style uh, program. I mean, the Manhattan Project, first of all, was with something that was, you know, you already pretty much knew what you were trying to do. Second of all, it was insanely expensive, and at some point was drawing something like a third of the electricity produced by uh, the TVA. Um, and, you know, it, and it didn't proceed particularly well. I mean, it was great for the scientists who basically got to be in, like, science camp for four years, just hanging out <laughs> together. And um, and it did give us a nuclear bomb, this, you know, I guess, a, a debatable achievement. Um, but 
I think that it's going to come from the private sector. And the way that you're going to, you know, the way that you encourage it to come from the private sector is that you price the externality and you, which makes people want to look. And it allows, you know, a thousand flowers to bloom, a bunch of people trying different ways to do this, to make energy happen. I I think that we're probably on the same page, nuclear deregulation. One of the amazing things, right, is that so few people realize the Yucca Mountain fight, which is one of these gigantic, this is created by the government. The reason we're even having this argument is that the government has forbidden us to reprocess the fuel, to get more fuel out of it. We wouldn't need a place to store all of this nuclear waste if we could, like every other country, reprocess our nuclear waste and get, you know, added energy out of it. So there's all of these, like, you know, so much of this, as you say, with the grid, well, all of this, it's created by government having inefficient coal plants, for example, because old inefficient plants are grandfathered in and don't have to meet air quality standards. Um, as soon as they upgrade, they do, which makes the upgrades much more expensive. So instead, we have a bunch of old, incredibly inefficient plants. All of the, there's so many places in which government regulation is making things happen the wrong way. So I would say I completely agree with you. The first thing is to attack those areas. The second thing yeah. I think to do is to tax the fuel sources um, and to, to make it possible for pri- the private sector – in places like nanotechnology and alternative fuels or whatever, don't subsidize them. Let, you know, let the market figure out what the most efficient way to do this is. Um, I can't, I'm actually not wearing my glasses because I'm completely vain. So I can't see how long we've been talking, Matt. (laughs) It's been, it's been an hour. I think that uh, we should uh, wrap up with uh, you describing to our dear viewers how a a good uh, DC libertarian is going to spend the 4th of July. Uh, I am actually going to the the Aspen Ideas Institute for the Atlantic. Ooh, so, uh, yes, I'm going to go have ideas. Um, or actually, more, I'm going to watch other people have ideas and be ignored by people much more famous than myself. Um, but, I'm uh, yeah, I'm going. I'm, on the 4th of July, I will actually be doing a, uh, a video chat. Uh, we call our, our video roundtables the table. So I will yes. be doing a special one with special guest people not from the Atlantic on uh, on the subject of digital media and the future of things like Facebook and blogging. Um, right. Yep, and I will be watching fireworks and uh, and you know desperately running after people go you know saying will you talk to me famous person um <laughs> probably having little success like most journalists right this is this is basically the career i've chosen i run after famous people and ask them to talk to me <laughs> well i'll be uh, at this rate uh uh you know uh watching my uh, wife give birth on july 4th yes so, uh, uh congratulations uh, we'll, we'll name uh, her lady liberty and uh, go from there so do, do you know uh, do you know whether it's a boy or a girl it's a girl and have you chosen a name yet, or is that a secret? Yeah, Megan McCardle uh, Welch, I think is what we're going to go for. Uh, I like a, that. Or it maybe has just Mick Megan. Can we do that? What? <laughs> Can Absolutely. we just go Mick Megan and uh, take care of it? Well, one actually, one of, my, one of my readers, uh, yeah, Mick Megan, it's, it's musical. Um, you know? <laughs> and no one else in the class will have that name. This is true. Uh, all right, well, let's wrap up here. Yeah, it was um, great talking to you. It was great talking to you. Uh, thank you, uh, uh Viewers out there in uh, in uh, La La Land and, and uh, such. Uh, once again, I'm Matt Welch from Reason Magazine, uh, with wonderful Megan McArdle from the Atlantic, and uh, and have a pleasant afternoon. Bye bye, internet.